Hi, I'm Eric Duplass. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, the goal of my talk today is to take uh, what Jeremy just did and try to map it onto Washington. Um, I also, as Bonnie suggested earlier, have done uh, put a lot of my time uh, working on the Western Climate Initiative over the years, so if you want to talk about some of those policies, um, you can also talk about that in the Q&A. Um, but for right now, uh, what I'm hoping to do is basically, as I said, take DC's carbon tax and map it onto um, Washington's economy so that even if we don't share precisely the same orientation uh, with respect to our preferences about carbon pricing, we're at least orienting or we're at least navigating on a common landscape. Uh, so uh, in brief, uh, I just want to characterize Washington's uh, sort of carbon economy uh, in a way that will allow us to share the common, common set of facts uh, about the sort of things that we can um, uh, that we could deal with if we were to apply something like DC's carbon tax here in Washington. So what would it cover? How much would it cost us? Uh, and are there any alternatives uh, to that? Um, the, the quick answer uh, is that if we were to apply um, something that looks very much like DC's carbon tax, and if we were to map that into Washington, we would cover about 85% of the total emissions of Washington State. So it's, it would be remarkably comprehensive. If we take um, a slightly more detailed look at it, this is one way of characterizing how, um, what Washington's carbon portfolio looks like. Um, a BC solid carbon tax would touch all of the, all of the sectors of that pie that have a color on them. It wouldn't touch uh, the ones that I've left in white there. Um, and as you can see, and as Jeremy suggested earlier, transportation is far and away um, the biggest issue we have in Washington. Uh, that electricity pot, wedge in the pie, uh, is something that Jim's going to talk a little bit more about after me. And that's a con what's called a, con or a production based inventory. So that's the, the electricity we actually produce in Washington um, as compared to the electricity that we consume in Washington. RCI fuels uh, is a term that many folks are not familiar with, and I'll talk about that a little bit more right now. That refers to um, residential, commercial, and industrial fuels, that is the natural gas that you might use to heat your home, the heating oil that you might use to heat your home, natural gas that's used in an industrial boiler, that sort of thing. Um, so this is a, a slightly more uh, detailed version uh, of what Washington's carbon footprint looks like. Um, Coal, the coal is a big slice right there, the slice in green, that's the Transalta facility in Centralia. We now have an agreement to phase that out completely by 2025. Uh, natural gas um, from electricity production, the next wedge, and then we have the two blue shaded wedges um, that are a portion of what I called the RCI fuels earlier. Uh, and then we have, uh, in yellow, the rest of the transportation sector, um, on-road diesel, on-road gasoline, and then, um, you know, kind of all the rest of the stuff that we, that we move goods and people around with the planes, trains, and boats. Uh, and actually, not all of that piece of the pie would be touched by ABC style carbon tax for complicated reasons. Uh, if a plane takes off here and flies to Japan, uh, it's not entirely clear uh, how you deal with the emissions or what's that. But we would be able to touch uh, a portion of it. And we would, as I said earlier, leave out um, the stuff that's, that's not shaded uh, with the color there. Uh, well, wow, there's supposed to be a picture here, and it would be a lot. Oh, there it is. Uh, <laughs> uh, one, of, one of the, the core principles behind a, a, a sensible carbon tax policy, like a sensible cap and trade policy, is that you don't you don't try to administer it at the a local disaggregated level of millions and millions of drivers of cars and do it upstream. Uh, in Washington, there are about 20 places where uh, petroleum, just to take an example, petroleum enters. <laughs> Uh, economy, the economy here. We already tax uh, a good portion of that uh, for highway fuel. So it's administratively, you know, reasonably simple uh, to go ahead and apply carbon tax, uh, at least to the petroleum sector. It's not too much different for the natural gas or for coal. Uh, of course, the price does get communicated down uh, to the consumers. It gets communicated in different ways, of course, with transportation fuels, it's fairly straightforward. Um, in other sectors, like the electricity sector, as Jim will talk about, uh, the price communication to consumers is a little bit um, less obvious. Uh, this is a, just a quick, sort of quick snapshot of the way that BC's carbon tax ladders up over time. As, as Jeremy said, it starts at 10 and ends up at 30. Uh, what, I, what I'll do is try to characterize what it looks like in Washington at that $30 um, price point, uh, where it will be in 2012. Uh, there's an open question, I think, about whether the, um, the carbon tax in BC will continue to escalate or whether it will level off there. Um, there's a little bit of a, a unit conversion we should do uh, on the scale matrix. Uh, uh, we don't need to obsess over the math because it turns out right now with um, near parity between the currencies, uh, it's close enough to government work. Uh, it's, it's, 20, uh, there's a, there's a, it's, it's pretty close to the same. Uh, 
So, uh, 30 bucks a ton of CO2 in five minutes. I see I've got left. Five minutes, or sorry, five bucks. I can't talk anymore. I've got five minutes left. <laughs> and $30 uh, a ton of CO2 translates um, pretty intuitively to 30 cents. So, uh, each dollar of the CO2 uh, tax uh, translates to about a penny. So, 30 bucks, 30 cents uh, per gallon of gasoline. About roughly three cents per kilowatt hour of coal fire power and about a penny and a half per kilowatt hour of natural gas power. So to put that into context, uh, gas was four bucks and six cents according to the US Department of Energy uh, in Washington last week. Uh, so tacking on a 30 cent carbon tax is actually a fairly modest increase in price relative to where we are now. Um, I, at least I think that's modest. I'm sure our legislature does not say that. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and perhaps we're going to consider that as well. But I think it's reasonable to assume that by the end of the summer, uh, we have more than made up that uh, orange increment uh, in the carbon tax. This is, and I apologize to uh, Jim who's coming after me, this was my strictly back of the envelope 30 minute calculation on Thursday about what a, what a carbon tax would look like if it were applied directly through. Uh, PSE is Puget Sound Energy and SCL is Seattle City Light. So probably most of them in this room are customers of one of those two um, utilities. Um, and SCL is a, City Light has a fairly clean portfolio, so um, the carbon tax would have a very minimal effect. PSE, which has uh, a heavier gas and coal portfolio, um, the increment would, would be a little bit high, but it's still not um, it's still not drastic at very much. <laughs> um, $2.2 .2 billion uh, a year in revenue. Uh, that's an estimate that Yaron made in the paper that's actually sitting outside. Um, and this does raise um, pretty big questions about what we do with the revenue. Uh, there are strong arguments to be made for revenue neutral carbon tax. There are also strong arguments to be made for investing in technology, energy efficiency retrofits, and all kinds of other worthwhile. Education, actually, is not a bad thing to do uh, with $2.2 .2 billion. Please. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but I'll leave that um, for a subsequent panel today. But I do think that spending the revenue from a carbon tax is, is in some ways, um, one of the very most important elements of it. I will mention uh, a, a subject that's come up already a little bit, which is what about um, cap and trade. As many folks in this room know, cap and trade is uh, a perfectly live policy that's operating right now uh, in Europe. It's operating in the Northeast the United States. All the states and provinces in green there. Uh, have at least taken a hard look at it, and as I suggested earlier, um, some of them are actually uh, moving forward with it right now. So there is, I think, a live question about um, about whether these are exclusive alternatives or not. I know people raise that question all the time. Um, the, the correct answer, I would submit, is that they're not mutually exclusive at all, as uh, Jeremy just talked about a moment ago. BC will soon have both, um, probably the best carbon tax in the world, and they will also have uh, a a very well designed cap and trade um, policy, so they can harmonize. Two minutes left. When I was, um, I used to go around uh, giving talks about cap and trade and explaining how it works to people. Uh, and one of the things I used to do when I was talking about cap and trade was try to remind people that no carbon taxes can also work well and they can work well uh, in harmony with, um, uh, with cap and trade. Uh, and now that we're talking about carbon taxes, I'm going to make the opposite case, uh, which is that. You basically, there's sort of a yin and yang of one another. You get price volatility um, with cap and trade, but you get emissions certainty. Um, so that's very valuable from a climate perspective in some ways. Um, the inverse of that, of course, is that uh, with carbon tax, you know what the price is, but you don't necessarily know what the emissions are you're going to get. Um, so in some ways, you could make a case that a, a harmonized approach that would incorporate both uh, carbon taxes and cap and trade, and you could harmonize them in a whole bunch of different ways that I'll be happy to unpack in detail if you ever feel like falling asleep with the sound of my voice. can <laughs> 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 provide you with something like, uh, it, it can at least improve the certainty uh, of prices and improve the uncertainty, the certainty of the emissions that you get. Um, uh, with respect to what the, a carbon tax uh, like British Columbia is would accomplish in Washington, um, I'm going to sound a bit like uh, Cliff Mass for a second. Um, we know the direction, uh, we know that we would achieve reductions in carbon. We don't know uh, what the magnitude uh, of the reductions would be. And there are a whole bunch of reasons for that. There are like shelves full of economics literature on um, the price elasticity or the demand elasticity of, um, of gas, just for example. We just don't know how to respond to prices over time. Uh, we, we do believe that the impact would be modest in the short term, um, but bigger over the long term. And